I'm Dr. Maneeb Shah, a board certified dermatologist, and I'm here today to answer more questions from the internet. This is Skin Support. At Mia Pinchoff asks, how many layers of skin do we have ballpark. It depends on how you look at the layers of the skin. So there's really three major layers of the skin. There's the epidermis, which is everything from this purple upwards, the dermis, which is where your collagen is, and then there's the hypodermis, which is your fat and the muscle and everything that's below that. You'll hear a lot of times five layers of the skin, but they're not talking about the entire skin in general. They're talking specifically about that epidermis layer, which has four when you're looking at the face, and it has five layers when you're looking at the palms and soles. At Ryan M. Stryker asks, is it possible that your lips can become addicted to chapstick? So a lot of times people like those fragranced and flavored lip balms, but it turns out that those a lot of times are irritating the skin, which makes you want to actually apply them more often. Not just that, but if you're somebody who's using flavored lip balms, it's gonna make you lick your lips more often. And that licking of your lips has enzymes in it that actually breaks down the skin around it, making you want to apply it more. So my recommendation, avoid fragrances in your lip balms, avoid mint in your lip balms, avoid any flavors in your lip balms, and use something that's gentle and fragrance free, and you'll probably see a huge benefit and you won't have to apply it as often. At CeeLo72 asks, what causes dry skin? So there's a few things that cause dry skin. One, it's your genetics. Two, it's your environment. And three, it's things that you potentially are doing wrong. So from a genetic perspective, a lot of people with eczema or atopic dermatitis, they have dry skin because they have abnormal lipid content and that epidermal layer of the skin. Low lipids like ceramides or abnormal lipids can cause you to naturally have drier skin. The second thing is the environment. So if you're in a condition that gets very cold, you have low humidity, we know that when the humidity drops in a room, within one day, your skin actually becomes dehydrated from losing water to the environment. And then the third thing is things that you potentially are doing wrong. So using very harsh cleansers, over scrubbing the skin, or using hot showers. Now think about it like this. When you're washing your dishes with cold water, you notice it doesn't remove the oils that well. But when you wash your dishes with hot water or warm water, it removes oils much more effectively. And the same thing happens in your skin. When you take a hot shower, it strips away all those natural oils, which can make your skin more dry. At Cosmo Damage asks, why is vitamin D so important for the skin? So it's not actually that vitamin D is important for the skin, it's that the skin is important for your vitamin D levels. About 90% of the vitamin D in your body comes from the skin. So sunlight actually converts cholesterol into vitamin D, producing most of the vitamin D in your body. Only about 10% comes from your diet. Vitamin D is super important to bone health in general. So there's something called rickets. When you have low vitamin D levels, your bones actually become very, very soft and they bend and they break very, very easily. Jay Micht asked, how does one get rid of an ingrown hair? So what you see here is actually a hair follicle and outside of that hair follicle, you're growing that hair. Now that's normal hair growth. But but with an ingrown hair, that hair can actually grow out and turn back into the skin, or sometimes it gets trapped and it never makes it out of the skin. While it's embedded in the skin, that can actually cause quite a bit of inflammation and irritation. And so what you'll actually notice is a red and painful bump. Now your body can sometimes push out that ingrown hair, but what ends up happening a lot of times is that you actually need to get it physically extracted by a dermatologist or an esthetician that can find the root of that hair and pull it out. Now you could do this at home if you clean the area and you use tweezers, but definitely be careful because you can develop a worsening infection. Now if you wanna prevent these ingrown hairs from happening, Happening. Avoiding much shorter hair, so if you if you don't shave your hair very short, that can prevent ingrown hairs. And if you use a glycolic acid exfoliant, that can also prevent ingrown hairs. And I've noticed in my own personal experience, using an electric trimmer prevents ingrown hairs for me compared to using a traditional razor. Fun characteristically asks, what is sweat composed of? What makes it smell? How might sweat on one part of the body differ from another? There's two major forms of sweat glands. So one is your eccrine sweat gland. So when you get sweaty palms and soles, that's majority eccrine sweat. It's pretty much just water and salt. And that sweat is actually usually pretty odorless. Now, when we think about body odor, the type of sweat gland that's producing body odor is something called the apocrine gland. And those apocrine glands are pretty much not active until puberty. And those are the ones that you find in the armpits, the groin, underneath the breast. And that's the one that produces that odorous smell. A lot of people don't realize that when you sweat apocrine sweat, 
It's actually odorless when you secrete it onto the body. It's mostly composed of lipids. And then you actually have bacteria on the skin that convert that solution into something that smells bad, ammonia and short chain fatty acids. And so if you eliminate the bacteria that's converting that sweat, you can actually eliminate body odor. So things like benzyl peroxide and chlorhexidine washes are really good at eliminating body odor. At Roja Aesthetics asks, what is the skin's microbiome? I don't wanna freak anyone out right now, but if I was to scrape your skin right now and look at it under the microscope, you would have essentially a jungle of organisms living on your skin. Every single one of you, I don't care how much you wash your face, you would have bacteria, you would have fungus, and you would have little mites crawling around on your skin right now. And that little jungle is actually called the microbiome, and they usually live in harmony and cause no problems to the skin. In fact, when there's a good healthy mix of things growing on your skin, it's actually good for you. And it's when one type of organism starts to sort of lead the jungle is when you start to develop things like acne. At FS Chick asks, how TF is the skin an organ? So an organ is supposed to be a collection of tissue that all serve the same purpose. The skin is considered an organ because its function is to protect you from the environment and also to keep things in the skin. So if you don't have your skin, which we actually see in people that have severe burns all over the body, you dehydrate very quickly because all the water in your body evaporates and you get infections very quickly because your skin's not protecting you from the environment. At Fame de la Fleur asks, does retinol cream really work? I personally use retinol, so I, I certainly hope that it works. If you're a skincare enthusiast, or even if you're on social media, you probably hear about all kinds of crazy trending ingredients all the time. And most of them don't stand the test of time. But retinol, on the other hand, which is a vitamin A derivative that we find in skincare, has been around now for 50 years, and the data is only getting better. And so tretinoin, which is the active form of retinol, it's found in prescription products, is incredibly effective, and then retinol is converted to tretinoin in the skin and is a very effective over-the-counter version of this vitamin A derivative. At Real Nutritious asks, do you know what really causes wrinkles? With time, there's two things that happen. So first you wanna look at yourself as a grape when you're a child. You're filled with juicy fluids and you don't have any wrinkles. And then you lose that volume with time and you become more like a raisin. And what is that volume that you're losing? Collagen, fat, bone, your skin starts to move in the direction of gravity, and then you form wrinkles. One of the most important contributors to aging is sun exposure and also diet. Diets high in sugar cause glycation, which actually damages your collagen. And when you lose that collagen, your wrinkles start to become more prominent. And so to avoid wrinkles, you wanna protect yourself from the sun. You wanna use healthy diets that are low in inflammation. And you also wanna do things that replenish the collagen, like use things like retinol. At Trenton Ferg asks, if we shed skin cells every single day, how is it that people have tattoos? <laughs> this is such a good question. So when we look at our skin shedding every day, we're actually talking about that epidermis layer of the skin that kind of sloughs off every day. So that's that very top layer of the skin. But below that, where all your collagen is hanging out, that's your dermis. And that's actually where they deposit tattoos. And that's why you don't shed off your tattoos. And interestingly, the particles of tattoo are too large to actually move and have your body remove them from the dermis. And so they actually just hang out there in the dermis. At CBG Beauty Bar asks, what does an LED light therapy mask do? This is a LED mask. And what you're noticing back here is some red light. To be honest, I honestly thought this was a gimmick myself. <laughs> I did a lot of research on LED masks masks in general, and it turns out they've done us quite a bit of study on light in general. So LED basically produces light in different wavelengths. When you look at what blue light does to the skin, it actually has anti-inflammatory and antibacterial properties of the skin. So if you have acne, it can actually target the porphyrins within your acne-causing bacteria to eliminate that. And then when you look at red light, the wavelength of red light between 600 and 700 nanometers can actually target the fibroblasts in that dermis layer of the skin to induce collagen production. We call that photobiomodulation. And so red light actually has profound anti-aging benefits and actually can help quite a bit with wrinkles. Butterscotch Good 3724 asks, do you think medical grade skincare is better than over the counter type items? I am here to debunk this and probably save a lot of you some money right now. So medical grade skincare is purely a marketing term. There is no standard definition of what medical grade skincare is. If a 
esthetician, med spa, dermatology office, or plastic surgery office is selling you skincare, a lot of times they will tell you that it's medical grade skincare. It just means they're selling it from their office. I could take a tube of toothpaste and call it medical grade skincare and no one is gonna stop me. You would hate me, but no one is gonna stop me. At Jess R. Morris asks, my freckles are going wild because of the sun. I love freckles so much, please. Why can't they be on me all year round? So what are freckles in the first place? Freckles are little blotches of melanin, which is basically the pigment of the skin. And so your melanocytes, which are the pigment producing cells of the skin, get hyperactivated and they produce little blotches. Now, I love freckles, I think that they're beautiful, but they get worse or more prominent with sun exposure and they fade in the winter when you get less sun exposure. So they're basically like mini tans, which is a marker of sun damage. And we do know that people that are prone to freckles are more likely to develop skin cancer. So if you're somebody who developed freckles, please be careful, wear sunscreen, your freckles will still be there, they just won't be as prominent, but it will also decrease your risk of getting skin cancer. At Sophia Kareem asks, how fast does hair grow? The average is essentially half an inch a month. It really depends on who you are, but it depends also on what part of the body. They all have different life cycles. So the, the life cycle of the hair is much longer on the scalp than it is on the eyebrows, and that's why your hair can be different on different parts of the body. But in general, to answer your question, about half an inch a month. At AR220323, so why are stretch marks permanent. People have actually biopsied stretch marks. What you find is a very thin epidermis and you actually find a scar-like pattern in the dermis where the collagen bundles and the elastic fibers are different than in normal skin. And so those different collagen fibers are actually causing that stretch mark to hang out for much longer after the stretching and growing has occurred. At Vegas Vanda I asks, why do we turn red when we get embarrassed? How does this help us survive? Well, we don't really know why this could be beneficial for you. What we do know is that what ends up happening, what's actually causing that redness is vasodilation of your blood vessels. So they become dilated and that increased blood flow appears as redness when you're embarrassed. At Wanda Laplunt, what exactly is psoriasis? Psoriasis is an inflammatory condition in the body. So what it looks like to you is plaques on the skin. So you have redness. On top of that redness is a micaceous, silvery scale. It's not contagious at all, but what's actually happening underneath those plaques is inflammation. It's really important to control that inflammation because not only is it affecting the skin, but it's affecting other organs in the body like the heart. At XO, Sophia asks, products aside, how many steps is your skincare routine? My current skincare routine is eight steps, but I feel like it needs to be 10. I feel like it needs to be less, quite honestly. Me personally, I have a three-step skincare routine maximum. Cleanse, treat, and protect. Cleanse is just a simple cleanser. Treatment is something that's targeted towards you. So if you have acne, you're gonna use a treatment that's targeted towards acne. If you have dark spots, the treatment is gonna be targeted towards dark spots. And then protect at night, that means moisturize. In the morning, that means wear sunscreen. At Mahe asks, does anyone have an SPF recommendation for people of color? I'm sick of these brutal white casts. So first, what is a white cast? It's that pasty white appearance that you see when people are wearing sunscreen. Some of you might remember that famous Mark Zuckerberg surfing picture where he has that amazing white cast over the face. As a dermatologist, I loved it, but it's not necessarily the thing that most people wanna have when they're walking around outside. So when you're looking at sunscreens, you have your chemical and you have your mineral sunscreens. Your chemical sunscreens are pretty much invisible a lot of the times nowadays. You can have a chemical sunscreen that is completely see-through. And then you have your mineral sunscreens that are zinc and titanium dioxide. And no matter how good the sunscreen is, they're still gonna have a little bit of white cast when you're looking at those mineral sunscreens. So if you're somebody who wants to completely avoid a white cast, opt for something that's more of a chemical sunscreen. Now, a lot of people are concerned about chemicals. I'm personally not worried about chemical sunscreens. The only ingredient I tell my patients to avoid is oxybenzone. Otherwise, the rest have been shown to be safe and effective. At Apollo Herbs asks, what's the difference between a serum, a cream, and a lotion. So there's no strict definition in what any of these things mean. It really has to do with the, the heaviness of the product overall. A serum is gonna be the lightest weight version of their product. It's almost gonna be like a liquid. A gel is gonna be a little bit closer to a cream, but it's gonna be a little bit more liquidy. Then a lotion is a little bit heavier than a gel. And then a cream is a little bit heavier than a lotion. And then an ointment's a little bit heavier than a cream. At Emily Sarah asks, am I the only weirdo who wonders why blackheads are black 
and yet yellow when squeezed out. You're definitely not the only weirdo, because I personally have asked this question many, many times before. When you actually are secreting this, what's happening in, in your pore essentially, is that you have oil glands and skin cells that are sloughing off into the pore, and they're clogging the pores with all of that sebum and sebaceous filaments. Sebaceous is essentially just the technical term for oil, and it's naturally a yellow substance. But then, at the tip of it, the tip closest to the surface is exposed to light and air. And with exposure to light and air, that yellow is oxidized, and so it becomes black, and it becomes what we call a blackhead. But once you push it out, you still have that yellow natural substance underneath it. At Just DD asks, question of the day, why do we all have fingerprints? <laughs> so we know that fingerprints develop at roughly 20 weeks when you're still in the womb. And it's a combination of things, but it's actually led mostly by genetics. So there's a few things too that contribute to this. So it could be the amount of amniotic fluid sl slushing around when you're in the womb. It could be the movement patterns. It could have to do with gravity to some extent. But we do know that genetic programming plays a really big role because if you were to scrape off your fingerprints, you would actually grow back the same fingerprints throughout your entire life. They actually never change. It's it's been debated why we even have fingerprints, and actually nobody knows, but we do believe that fingerprints actually do add some grip. And so that's the running thesis, but we actually have no idea how this beautiful body works. At Pure Radiance HW asks, hashtag skincare, does the weather affect your skin? So let's talk about the extreme conditions, winter and summer. So in the winter, it's very dry, it's very cold. And so people's skin tends to get very dry. You lose a lot of moisture from your skin into the environment. And a lot of people need to use more moisturizing products. Now, just because it's the winter and you're not getting as much sun exposure doesn't mean you don't need to wear sunscreen because you still get UVA and UVB exposure, especially if you're skiing and in high altitudes. So definitely wear sunscreen in the winter as well. Now, when we look at the summer, the extreme conditions of that, heat, humidity, so your skin tends to not be as dry, but you're exposed to much more sunlight, and this is where you're gonna be more diligent about sunscreen. If you're out at the beach and you're gonna be in the sun all day, reapplying your sunscreen every two hours is gonna make a big difference. That wraps up skin support. I hope you learned something. We'll see you next time.